Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is still true and directly related to our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Have you ever wondered why the Jews simply do not understand that Jesus, or his Hebrew name being Yeshua, is the Messiah as prescribed by the prophets so long ago? It just seems so simple to us. We often like to think that if we just present them the New Testament, that they should get it. And if they then reject it, then it was their fault. But is it really their fault? What part do we play? If you are really serious in your mission to evangelize, then here comes the real challenge. Could you prove to someone Jewish that Yeshua is the Messiah? That is what Paul did day after day in the synagogues in the book of Acts. And so many thousands of Jews understood Yeshua to be the Messiah and that he sacrificed himself for us, our sin. That is not happening as much today. Why? It is not like Jews today know the scriptures any better than they did in the first century. What would you say to someone that was Jewish? Could you convince them that Yeshua is the promised Messiah? What could possibly be the problem about Yeshua? In the first 14 years after the cross, there were only Jews learning about the first coming and identity of their Messiah. Thousands and thousands of Jews. Gentiles were not even really in the picture yet, only Jews. We can read about that in the book of Acts. No one denies it. Why are not thousands, if not tens of thousands of Jews coming to know their Jewish Messiah Yeshua like they did in the first century? Did something change? What happened? Why did that stop? Are many teaching something different than what our Messiah really taught? Are many teaching something different than what the apostles taught? Are many teaching something different than what Paul taught? They brought thousands of Jews to know the Messiah. What is the big problem? What is our problem? There are several problems, and most are addressable. Perhaps it is simply a misunderstanding of prophecy. Or perhaps they are holding on to too many traditions that are against the Word of God, and it blinds them. For example, Mark chapter 7, verse 13. It is certainly hard to see Yeshua as the Word of God in the flesh, when one's own doctrine is against the Word of God. For some Jews, those are certainly problems. We cover a lot of these misunderstandings in our Brit Hadashah series. Though it takes much time and much patience, all of those obstacles can be removed. For Paul, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. We're not discounting that some of these Jews were broken off the tree, Romans 11. But many did get it, thanks to Yeshua, thanks to the apostles, thanks to Paul. We are going to cover the number one reason why Jews have a difficult time accepting Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah. Let's enter into the context of the first century. We see Paul teaching the Word of God and Christ in the synagogues quite often. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Acts 17, verse 17. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Acts 18, verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Acts 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. It requires much knowledge about prophecy and the gospel accounts of Yeshua to reason with the Jews. Sometimes Paul was successful with the Jews. On the other hand, as we already mentioned, quite often Jewish leadership was against Paul, just like they were against Yeshua. Paul, like Yeshua, threatened their established mainstream religious system of traditions and doctrines, which Yeshua equated to lawlessness. Paul taught against traditions and doctrines that were also against what Moses wrote just like Yeshua did in Mark chapter 7, 
John chapter 7, verse 19, and Matthew chapter 23. Simply put, Yeshua taught that what Moses wrote is good, and that the traditions and doctrines of Jewish leadership that nullified Moses simply was a bad idea. Many Jews began to abandon this theological evolution that became these false religious traditions and ways, and instead, they began to only follow the Word of God and Yeshua. Because of this, Jewish leadership began to panic. It began to rattle their cage. Their power and influence was being threatened. Just to be clear, Yeshua and his followers did not teach against what Moses wrote. They taught against what the Jews called the oral law, or the commandments of men. Today, it is called or referred to as the Talmud. The Talmud is the version of the oral law of the Jews that was written down. The Talmud added on to the law of God. It built fences around the word of God. Through their own detailed commandments, they decided how God's people should keep God's commandments. They tightened up the parameters. They made things up. They built such walls around God's word that it was hard to even see what was left of God's word in their doctrine and action. God's word became hidden, and thus, according to Yeshua, nullified or made void. They built a false religion around the truth of the word of God. Because of the man-made commandments, God's law became a yoke or a burden to such an extent that it was no longer God's law, but a system of laws built around the law of God. For instance, on the Sabbath, our Creator simply told us to rest, for our animals to rest, and for our servants to rest. The oral law, known today as the Talmud, would prescribe hundreds of ways to define what it meant to rest and not work. Man told you how to obey God. Man became who you were actually following, though you were supposedly following God. In this system, men become God. Those who claimed authority in this oral law began to see their system and their ways being threatened by Yeshua and all who followed him. Yeshua and his followers were bringing people into just following the word of God, not the commandments of men. Because of this, the Pharisees and Sadducees decided to take action against those that threatened their false ways. They had to make it seem as though Yeshua was against what Moses wrote, because technically, disagreeing with the Talmud was not enforceable, as it was not technically the law of God. It simply made them angry when others would not follow their doctrine and traditions found in the Talmud. Here is where it becomes interesting. Because Jewish leadership could not prove that Yeshua and his followers taught against what Moses wrote, they had to set up false witnesses against them. Sadly, this is what happened to Stephen, a Jew who was not part of the many Jewish traditions and began to follow only Yeshua and the Word of God. Acts chapter 6 verse 13. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law, meaning the law of Moses, the Torah. For we have heard him say that this Yeshua of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. It is very clear here that it is considered false testimony to say that Yeshua changed the ways of God as written by Moses. If it was true then it would be a true testimony, not a false testimony. If you recall, they tried to do the same thing to Yeshua. In Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, they accused him of breaking the Sabbath, when in reality, he was only breaking the Jewish tradition and doctrine, the Talmud. In the law of God, picking and eating the same grain does not break any of God's commandments. There is no such commandment in the Bible found anywhere. It does, however, break certain rabbinical commandments, which is what Yeshua's goal was. The Talmud says, in case a woman rolls wheat to remove the husks, it is considered as sifting. If she rubs the heads of wheat, it is regarded as threshing. If she cleans off side adherencies, it is sifting out fruit. If she bruises the ears, it is grinding. If she throws them up in her hand, it is winnowing. If Yeshua broke any commandment of God, then he would have been committing sin, 1 John 3, 4. And he would not have been our perfect sacrifice. Any doctrine that has Yeshua teaching or practicing anything contrary to what Moses wrote, or anything already established as truth in the Word, just turned his perfect sacrifice 
into an imperfect sacrifice based on the Bible's own definition of perfect. The Talmud, or the Oral Law, even prescribes a particular way to wash one's hands before eating. At one point, Yeshua even taught against the Pharisees on this matter. Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwashed hands? Notice how the Pharisees and the scribes point to a tradition of the elders, not a commandment of God, and then begin trying to correct and rebuke Yeshua and his disciples based on a tradition, based on a commandment of men. Obviously, it is not that washing hands is necessarily bad. Most people today wash their hands before they eat. It is the fact that they associated spiritual cleanliness and uncleanliness to their commandments that it then became a problem. They even prescribed how the hand washing ritual was to be done. It is all in the Jewish Talmud if one wants to read it. Only God can dictate what circumstances and practices can cause a person to be clean or unclean not men. They overstepped their boundaries and started taking on authority that only God retained. This prompts Yeshua to teach them to come back to only what Moses wrote and discard their vain traditions and doctrines, back to placing themselves under the authority of God, not above it. Mark chapter 7 verses 8 through 13. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. For Moses said, notice how he's equating Moses with the commandments of God. Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God, equating Moses back to the word of God, by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. The Jews esteemed their ways so much, they did not even realize that they were in error. According to Yeshua and Matthew 23, they would even read the law of God from Moses' seat verbatim. But in their doctrines and practices, they would not practice what they just read. Instead, they made up their own commandments and practices, such as the washing of your hands before eating bread, or not rubbing two grains together on the Sabbath. They taught two different laws. They taught what Moses wrote from the seat of Moses, and they taught the Talmud, the oral law, which nullified what Moses wrote in many instances. They are called hypocrites. We are to do the first, not the latter, according to Yeshua. Here is an actual picture of the seat of Moses. This practice of reading the Torah word for word actually began with Moses, hence why it is called Moses' seat. Exodus 18, verses 13 through 16. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his laws, the Torah. So Moses was reading the Torah from his seat. Just as Moses did, from this seat, the scribes and the Pharisees would only read exactly what Moses wrote, which according to Moses was the statutes of God and his Torah the law of God. That being read in the seat of Moses, the Torah, is what Yeshua said that we should observe and do. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 3. 
Then Yeshua spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. So our Messiah is literally saying to obey the Torah, because it is the Torah that is read from the seat of Moses. Sadly, though, when Jewish leadership would leave the seat of Moses, after reading the law of God, they began offering and teaching their interpretations and practices that were actually directly against what Moses said. As Yeshua continued, But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. They were hypocrites. They taught the law of God, but did not do the law of God. Yeshua constantly called them out on it and they hated him for it. They liked their religion. John chapter 7, verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? If we continue reading Matthew 23, we find that it is their heart that was in the wrong place. Even when they followed God's commandments and their own ways, it was only to puff themselves up as a means for attention to themselves. They taught the law of God, but did another law, their own. And for this, they were called hypocrites and vipers, Matthew 23, 28. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Matthew 23, 32. Serpent, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? The real purpose of all obedience to God's commandments is to love God and to love others, to humble ourselves and make ourselves low, not to love ourselves and raise ourselves up. That is what Moses wrote, and the Pharisees missed it. The author of Psalm 119 most certainly understood that. That is why Jewish leadership had such a problem with Yeshua and his followers, because he fully taught the true purpose of the law of God as written by Moses. Jewish leadership continued an effort to continue to try to protect their false religious ways that were against Moses. They even began to go after Paul, once again, just like they did with Yeshua, setting up false accusations that he taught against what Moses wrote. Acts chapter 21, verses 20 through 22. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law, the Torah. Note here how true believers are zealous for the law of God, and that Paul is being accused of forsaking what Moses taught. James declares that the accusations against Paul are false, that Paul keeps and teaches the whole law of God as written by Moses. And get this, and this is very interesting. James defines orderly, or walking orderly, as keeping the law of God. If James says that Paul most certainly kept and taught what Moses wrote, and since Paul went forward with James' recommendation to prove that he did not teach against Moses, then we can only have three possible conclusions that we can make. Either James and Paul were either liars, lunatics, or legit. Again, James even defines that walking orderly means keeping the law of Moses. This would also mean that James teaches that if one is not walking and teaching according to what Moses wrote, that one is walking disorderly. Unless we want to begin accusing Paul and James of being liars or lunatics, then we must go with legit. For those who are completely convinced in their understanding about Paul's letters and believe that they clearly teach against what Moses wrote, 
might be immensely confused here. But that is why Peter issued a warning about Paul's letters, saying that they are difficult to understand, so easily twisted, and they can lead to lawlessness. Many read Paul's letters and make the same accusations against Paul that the Pharisees were making. It is simply unparalleled irony and nearly humorous if it were not such a serious error. Acts chapter 21 was not a unique situation for Paul in the least. The attacks on Paul that he taught against what Moses wrote were relentless, just like they are today. Paul continues to receive the same false accusations. Acts chapter 24. Nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. Acts chapter 25. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. You would think all they would have to do is read Paul's letters to prove their accusations against Paul. That is what so many teach today. Supposedly, if you want to understand what Moses wrote as being obsolete and done away with, then read Paul. Read Galatians. Wouldn't you think that the Pharisees would have thought of that in their accusations? If Paul's letters really taught against what Moses wrote, then Jewish leadership could have easily proven their accusations against Paul. Paul's own letters should condemn him here. But here's the thing. Paul and James say that using his letters in such a way is making false accusations against him. The unfortunate reality, though, is that many just misunderstand Paul's letters and fail to examine them from a first century Hebraic context in which they were authored and delivered. The Pharisees could not use Paul's letters to support their accusations that Paul taught against Moses because they understood the debate. They understood the first century context and Hebraic thinking. Even though much of the first century Jewish leadership was trying to successfully accuse Paul, many Jews began following Yeshua and the Word of God only instead, leaving behind much of the air found in the doctrinal religious baggage, the extra stuff that dominant religious system added to the Word of God. This proves that the Jews who believed all the law and prophets to be true could also believe and follow in Yeshua. It was not impossible. Jews began to follow Yeshua. They recognized him as the promised Jewish Messiah. The problems of misunderstanding prophecy or the problematic religious baggage could be overcome in the first century, and for thousands of Jews, that was the case. The same problems that Paul dealt with in the first century, such as religious baggage or misunderstandings of prophecy, still exist in Jewish communities today. These things have not changed, and there are still many Jews that do not like it if you begin teaching against the Talmud. They react the same way today as they did to Yeshua and Paul. But even if you address and overcome all of these things, it is nearly certain that you are still wasting your time. For instance, there are even Jews today called the Karaites, meaning pure scripturalist, that realize the scriptural problems of the Talmud, just like Yeshua did. Yet they still do not accept him. Even when the major obstacle that was present in the first century is removed, the Talmud, they still reject him. Why? Today, we have a new problem. Remember all the accusations against Yeshua, against Stephen, against Paul, that were clearly said to be false accusations? The accusations that what Moses wrote had changed? The accusations that Yeshua came to change the law of God? The false accusations that Paul taught against what Moses wrote? In the first century, when Jewish leadership made such accusations, they were said to be false. Sadly, today, Mainstream Christianity makes the exact same accusations against Yeshua, against Paul, and now calls them true. They call them true accusations. You might be rather offended at that, or you might say, so what? What does it really matter? It matters if you want a Jewish person to know their Messiah. If you do not care about the Jews knowing the Jewish Messiah, then you're right, maybe it doesn't matter. 
However, if we are really serious about evangelism, then we have a problem and we need to deal with it. There remains one massive issue that will prevent a Jewish person from knowing their Jewish Messiah 100% of the time. As long as they know and believe the Old Testament to be 100% true, a Jew that does not believe the front of the Bible to be true does not have this problem. Or maybe a Jew that does not really understand the front of the Bible also does not have this problem. But as long as they believe and know the law, prophets, and writings, then you will have no hope in being successful in a typical presentation of Jesus to a Jew. Do you want to know why? This is no small issue. There are millions of people in the world who believe the front half of the Bible to be true, but still reject the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. Why? In the first century, and for a couple of centuries thereafter, Jews were coming to know the Messiah in multitudes. But largely, for the most part, this is not happening today, nor has it for the last 1700 years, more or less. A Jew who knows their scripture well is the most likely of all to reject the typical presentation of Yeshua. They have no choice. Why? The answer is both shocking and rather offensive to our current mainstream doctrines. We do not like the answer, but we cannot deny the truth either. Millions of Jews will never know their Savior for this reason. The reason many Jews deny Jesus when he is being presented to them is because God told the Jews to not accept Jesus. Let us say that more clearly. God told anyone who believes the Old Testament to be true to not believe in the typical presentation of Jesus. Now, before you scream heretic and stop the teaching, let's just test what was just said to the Word of God. Remember what we established earlier. In the first century, Yeshua, Stephen, and Paul taught and practiced what Moses wrote. Jewish leadership had issues with only following the Word of God and not the Talmud that they also liked to teach and enforce. Thus, Jewish leadership set up false accusations against Yeshua and against Stephen and against Paul that they all taught against Moses. Those, of course, were false accusations according to what was written in the Bible. They did indeed teach what Moses wrote. If Paul was actually against Moses, not one Jew would believe anything he said, ever. The Jews believe that the Old Testament is truth. They also believe that God meant what he said. God said to not believe anyone that changes the law of God. God said that is a false prophet. Jews believe God when he had Moses write it, and thus Jews cannot believe the typical presentation of Jesus or Paul. Because the typical presentation of Jesus and Paul teach that Jesus came to create a new religion called Christianity and that there are new commandments established and the old is done away with. Deuteronomy 13 teaches that if any prophet arises and entices you to go after any other commandments other than the commandments that were already given by Moses, then it is the same as going after other gods, even if their signs, wonders, and visions came true. This is why the introductive verse just before Deuteronomy 13 says the following. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. This is very important because some attempt to pretend that Deuteronomy 13 is only about teaching against following other gods. We are told to not add to or take away from the Torah, the law of God, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32 directly prefacing Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13 then teaches that if anyone does add to or take away from the law of God and entices others to do this, that they are a false prophet, which is the same as following false gods. Why? Because if you are adding or taking away from the law of God, then you are following instructions not from God, but from man making man out to be your own God. If we present Yeshua, or even Paul, as working miracles and having true visions, signs, and wonders, yet also teach different commandments using their teachings, a true Jew would reject that without hesitation. Not because they are stubborn, ignorant, prideful, or anything of the like. Why? Because they believe the first half of the Bible to be true. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. 
If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after Yahweh your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which Yahweh your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. So here in Deuteronomy 13, we have it said clearly. Anyone as a prophet, even if their signs or wonders come true, if they teach anything that causes his people to go away from or differ from the commandments that were given by Moses, that is to be considered evil in the midst. Adding to the Torah or taking away from the Torah is going after other gods. In the way that mainstream Christianity presents Jesus and Paul, really for all intents and purposes, the whole New Testament, Jews have no choice but to consider Jesus and Paul false. Not because Jesus and Paul were really false, but because modern doctrine teaches that the law of God has changed and then use Jesus and Paul to do so. Millions of Jews will never know their Savior. They will never know the blessing of the new covenant in which the same law is to be written on our heart, not a changed law. And they know this. They have read the prophets. According to Ezekiel 36 verses 26 through 27, the Spirit is supposed to lead them in truth, to keep the law of God, not a spirit to lead them away from the law of God. It is their belief in the Old Testament as truth coupled with a misunderstanding of Paul that prevents their belief that the New Testament is true. Even when Paul and James defended against such a misunderstanding, and Peter, he warned us in advance that such a misunderstanding of Paul's letters were very easy to make, leading to lawlessness. Deuteronomy 13 continues, commending the Jews who decide to not go after different commandments, those that do not abolish or make obsolete God's commandments commending the Jews who do not remove one jot or tittle from the law of God. Instead, continue to fulfill the law of God, to fully preach the law of God, just as Yeshua did by living it out as the way, truth, life, light, and perfect freedom as the Word in the flesh did, as we are also called to walk in the very same image that we are to conform to. Deuteronomy 13. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand that Yahweh may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers, because you have listened to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh your God. It is because many continue making the same false accusations against Yeshua and Paul that Jews reject Yeshua and Paul. The Jews have to. God told them in the Word of God. They believe the Word of God to be true. You would also think that most Christians would reject the false accusations against Yeshua and Paul as well, since it is taught by the same that the Old Testament is also true. Deuteronomy 12.31 is also a problem. God clearly said that we are not to worship Him in the same way that false gods were worshipped. He hates their ways and traditions and false god holidays. Even if for some reason we like such traditions and ways, God said to not use those days and those ways to worship Him. Deuteronomy 12.31 You shall not worship Yahweh your God in their way, for every abomination to Yahweh which He hates they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. We should be just fine with God telling us to not worship Him in pagan ways and days. This should be fine with us because it should only be about worshiping God how He wants to be worshipped, not how we want to worship Him. But Jews know full well that holidays like Christmas and Easter 
are derived from suspect origins and perhaps incorporate false god worship traditions, all repackaged with a Jesus stamp intended to worship and celebrate God. The problem is that Jews believe the Old Testament to be true. Any successful evangelism of a true Jew would stop here. This would quickly be strike two for the average Christian missionary. The problem for the Christian missionary is that he cannot change what the Jews are saying. It's in the Bible. In this, there is little difference in what the Jews did in creating the Talmud as with these such traditions. The Jews see the hypocrisy, the contradiction. Thus, we have millions of Jews who do not know their Messiah because so many hold on to the false accusations against Yeshua and Paul and also incorporate the suspect false God ways, days, and traditions into their worship of God. The Bible already contains legitimate biblical holidays, which are found in Leviticus 23. Those are the holidays that God made for us, to bless us. Even the very next verse, following verse 31, is yet another reason why a Jew who believes the front of our Bible to be true cannot accept a typical presentation of Yeshua and Paul. Deuteronomy 12, 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Yeshua could not be adding to or taking away from what Moses wrote, or he would be clearly breaking a commandment of God. That would be called sinning. That would be a very bad thing for someone we claim to be our perfect sinless sacrifice. We cannot present Paul as a sinner either. Paul could not create doctrine that adds to or takes away from the law of God. That is a quick strike three to the Jew who believes the front of the Bible is truth. There are dozens of other problems that all result in a false understanding of Yeshua and Paul as it relates to what Moses wrote. Those are just several. Perhaps the Jewish people will someday be afforded a real interest in evangelism, one that incorporates a real and true presentation of both Yeshua and Paul. Even today, Paul is still defending himself in Acts against such false accusations, and Peter is still warning us in advance about misunderstanding Paul's letters leading to lawlessness. Stephen's accusers are still as false today as they were in the first century. Yeshua did not come to change anything in Moses. All of the commandments of God are to be practiced for the same reason. Because we love God. Because God's ways are perfect. Because God's ways are freedom from sinning. Because God's ways are truth. Because God's ways are light. And we could go on and on why the law of God is such a blessing. Read Psalm 119. That guy had it figured out. We are all saved by grace in the faith. Remember that. We are saved by grace. Because our faith, though, is in the Word of God, and that is what our Messiah Yeshua taught, and if we really believe the Word of God to be true, it will be evident in our behavior. And remember, the front of the book is also the Word of God. Obedience to the law of God is a product of our faith and evidence of our faith. It is a gift that God even grants us such perfect instruction. And in closing, just so it is clear, there is often confusion that Moses was never intended for anyone but those who had a genetic lineage to Israel. Moses wrote that there is one law of God for all, the natural-born Israelite, and also for the alien, foreigner, or Gentile that is grafted into Israel by faith. Numbers 15, verses 15 through 16. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the foreigner who dwells with you, an ordinance forever throughout your generations. As you are, so shall this stranger be before Yahweh. One law and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. There is no such thing as a law of God for the Jews and a law of God for the Gentiles. He granted His perfect instruction to everyone, so no one misses out. This teaching likely generated some more questions. Now that we know that Messiah Yeshua taught all believers to observe the Torah, you may wonder how it all fits together with often misunderstood passages such as Acts 10. Well, we have a teaching for that called Acts 10, Peter's vision. Or Acts 15. We also have a teaching for that called Acts 15, legalism or obedience. Or any number of verses by Paul. We actually have a whole series dedicated to Paul called the Pauline Paradox series. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom.
it is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.